Um, our first our first presenter uh, today uh, will be um, Peter Miller uh, of the University of Iowa, and uh, he's a PhD candidate in religious studies and classics. And he focuses on religious diversity of the late uh, ancient Mediterranean world, an absolutely wonderful topic, uh, late antiquity. He's currently writing, uh, I mean, he, he has just told me that he's going to defend his uh, dissertation uh, entitled The Usual Labors and Wealth uh, of Philosophy in, uh, in April of this year. Um, so uh, I hope that goes really well. Um, but today he's here to talk about something quite uh, different. Um, Satan, Savior, Muse, Messiah, Prometheus, Many Afterlives in Metal Music. Um, and I hand it over to, to Peter. Thank you very much for that. Um, in the interest of accessibility, uh, if you don't want to rely on the auto captioning, I have uploaded a transcript of this paper to the Google Drive so you can follow along there. That is easier. We'll not have to deal with the auto captioning there. And while I set up my screen share here, just a brief content warning since we're dealing with the myth of Prometheus. There will be some discussion uh, and artistic depictions of uh, scenes of torture and gore. Uh, be aware of that. If you are uncomfortable with the images, uh, feel free to minimize me. I don't take offense. And if you need to step away, uh, obviously, no problem. So uh, let's go ahead and get going. So uh, Prometheus is first glimpsed in the Greek written record uh, with the 8th century BCE poet Hesiod who tells the reader about how the Titan tricked the king of the gods and subsequently stole fire and a fennel stock for humankind. The story appears twice, once in the Theogony and again in a slightly altered form in Works and Days, where the general story remains constant with a few details moved around. In the fifth century BCE, Prometheus became the subject of an Athenian tragedy by Aeschylus. Prometheus Bound centered the narrative, largely familiar from Hesiod, on the suffering of the Titan who remains chained at center stage for the duration of the play. In this account, Prometheus is responsible not just for fire, but for the catalog of the arts. A uh, list of the crafts and skills Prometheus's fire brought with it, writing, medicine, mathematics, astronomy, metalworking, construction, and agriculture. Prometheus is seen by Aeschylus as punished beyond reason and an empathetic patron of civilization. In a departure from the punishment narratives, I'd also like to draw attention to two other accounts of Prometheus we're going to see. Within the Aesop's fables tradition, accounts of a very different Prometheus, both associated with the shaping and molding of humanity, can be found. Uh, the Phaedrus 4, 15, and 16 fragments present the Titan as the craftsman, making human beings from clay, including citing him as the Auctor Wulgi Fictilis, or maker of our common clay. These accounts, though, see Prometheus choosing to get drunk with Bacchus and mistakenly applying incorrect genitals to nearly finished bodies. Uh, these two lines, Prometheus the thief and Prometheus the sculptor, have abundant additional sources in other Greek and Latin authors, largely reliant on these two broad strains. Prometheus, particularly the empathetic portrayal in Aeschylus's tragedy, casts a long shadow in literature and mythic reception. The recurring scenes of fire, blood, iron, and rebellion uh, associated with the Titan who tricked Zeus have found fertile ground in metal music in particular, which is the focus of my talk today. Through my research into the ways that musicians have referenced and utilized Prometheus, I've created four general categories that draw upon different parts of the myth and its lineage through philosophy, art, fiction, and even conspiracy theory. These four categories are the title of my talk, Prometheus as Satan, Savior, Muse, or Messiah. Over the next few minutes, I'll overview what each of these categories seems to draw upon and share examples from these receptions. As primarily a literary researcher, my work here is in large part a lyrical analysis, focusing on common points of motif, metaphor, language, and characterization. By far the most common portrayal of Prometheus in metal music is the joining of the figures of Lucifer and Prometheus. In this case, the Lucifer in question draws inspiration from Milton's Paradise Lost, where the charismatic fallen angel has won sympathy from readers for generations as a rebel against an unjust God, at least in his own words. 
Raphael Judas Weberblowski outlined these overlaps by arguing that both Prometheus and Milton's Lucifer fit within an archetype that highlights the risks of progress and civilization. Writing in the wake of the horrors of World War II, Weberblowski sees in Satan, quote, the prototype of the human civilizing efforts, end quote. The charismatic rebel punished by an unjust system finds common cause in metal. Mexican doom metal band for centuries draws this comparison in their 2020 single Prometheus and the Lignum Scientiae. The Lignum Scientiae of the title is from the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible, a reference to the tree of knowledge from which Adam and Eve are tempted to eat by the serpent. Drawing parallel between Prometheus's civilizing gifts and the knowledge forbidden by God, Four centuries makes of Satan a knowledge-given patron. The link is made explicit in the closing stanzas of the song. You are the blinded strayed, wasting a precious gift I gave. Few opened eyes to see, so join me in the shades and take my left hand, come and burn with me. I am Prometheus, the Alpha and the Omega. I am Lucifer, the provider of the Lignum Scientiae. Similar framing is found in the now defunct Italian band Olive's Gift of Prometheus from their 2000 EP, Tragedies Laid by Divine Hands. This song spoken from the character of Lucifer's perspective puts in the devil's mouth the link to Prometheus's rebellion. Once upon an ancient time, there's a brilliant man of your kind. He stole the primal fire from the gods and became free, unbound his power and his will to laugh even about the destiny itself. Fire is knowledge, inconstant and dangerous. It brightens the mind. Knowledge is fire, the gift of Prometheus, and also a gift of mine. Notably, Prometheus is here described as unbound by his theft rather than punished. Are we to believe this is a half-truth by the ever-charming Lucifer, or a convenient leap to the ultimate freedom of Prometheus once Heracles arrives in Greek myth? The following stanza summarizes the freedom meant by the speaker. He knew it was a dangerous way to keep, just following his heart, and even punished to suffer forever inside his soul smiled as it had wings. Olaf imagines Prometheus happy in his freedom, chained to a rock, a stoic satisfaction in knowing his punishment is unjust, a freedom fully internalized. The synthesis of Lucifer and Prometheus, whether as mythic parallels or in the blending of the characters into one, is a means for expressing often an anti-religion or at least an anti-institutional Christianity perspective common in metal. This afterlife of Prometheus is most interested in both the imagery and punishment to highlight the injustice of a god, gods, or society, while celebrating the first rebel and inviting the listener to join the ranks of the righteous anti-authoritarians. But the framing of Satan as a benefactor of humankind leads naturally to my next proposed category, Prometheus as savior of mortals. In order to sample the place of Prometheus as savior, I want to highlight what I mean by the term, especially given our final category will be that of Messiah. Through the examples of Emperor's Prometheus, the discipline of fire and demise, and Xenobiotic's Prometheus, uh, I will build our working definition. Within this category, the focus of the lyricist moves to the intervention by Prometheus on behalf of humanity. The figure described in Promethean terms may be human or divine. Consider the narrator's words in Emperor's fourth track, The Prophet. Uh, it is the time after miracles, and I am its prophet, a mortal vessel. I have not come to cure, but bear to witness decease. It is the place where blood and soil lie beyond the boundaries of the sun, and I am its prophet. I cast the shadow, I absorb the light. The opening lines of the next song, The Tongue of Fire, give some more, just a few highlights. Teach me the tongue of fire so that I may set the world ablaze, for it is cold and the blindness can no longer give me shelter. Teach me the tongue of fire so that I may cry out loud my wrath and my passion, or else my coil will blister and decay. The promised prophesied gift in question is described in apocalyptic terms, a cleansing fire to destroy a world gone astray. Like a prophet of the Hebrew Bible burdened to speak destruction to, the, to a city, the speaker is forced to live the guidance of a superior force identified throughout the album as the mystery. This mystery warns that should the mortal vehicle for this wrath fail to live up to its code, it will depart and manifest another. The album concludes with the song Thorns on My Grave, in which the burden of apocalyptic wrath born within mortal body is made apparent. I hereby commit my body to the ground, sterilized and wrapped in plastic foil, being an object of this space and time. This body should remain concealed for it holds every disease ever exposed. It holds all pain and death I could ever unleash. Sorry, never unleash. 
It's an important N. Uh, the burial of the primary figure of the album is uh, at long last sees the figure wrapped and isolated like a piece of medical waste for the dangers within. This may be a reference to Pandora's box, a punishment from Zeus wrought in the wake of Prometheus's theft of fire as the penalty for humankind, a link often left out in the retelling of Prometheus's story among early modern and contemporary authors. The corpse in an unremarkable grave holds untold horrors awaiting release, but the world is cautioned not to open it, instead only to lay thorns at the grave. Emperor's Prometheus is among the earliest albums dedicated in part or full to Prometheus that I've found within the world of metal music, though we'll see at least one earlier example track uh, later in a different subgenre. Xenobiotics 2018 album Prometheus similarly weaves a singular narrative across its tracks, though this time explicitly from the perspective of Prometheus himself, who is moved by pity for humankind. His motivation mirrors the poetic writings portrayed by Goethe in the 18th century. I'm just going to read a couple highlighted pieces from his poem here. I honor you. Why? Have you ever lightened the sorrows of the burdened? Have you ever dried the tears of the anguish stricken? Was I not fashioned to be a man by almighty time and by eternal fate, my master and yours? Skipping ahead. Here sit I forming humans after my image, a kin after myself, to suffer, to weep, to enjoy, to be glad and to heed you not as I. In parallel, consider these lines from the opening two tracks of Xenobiotic's album, Prometheus 1, Ether, and Prometheus 2, Genesis. Uh, just reading the highlighted sections. Shall I honor you? What for? Have you softened the pains of burden? Have you silenced the tears of anguish? O holiest of burning hearts? I imagine that is sarcastic. Uh, they will be like me, suffer as I suffer, weep as I wept, live as I live, and they will bear the disdain that I bear. I will teach them to see in feeble vessels of flesh and blood, of skin and bone. They will become unbreakable. They will become unyielding. Xenobiotic's album follows then with a meditation on the danger and destruction wrought by the technology, taking on an edge of environmentalism as Prometheus is forced to watch humanity wage war and destroy the earth through the misuse of his gift. Patron, benefactor, or even creator, the Titan is forced to stand trial for the crimes of mortal humans, whereupon he proclaims before the judgment hall of the gods, I am guilty. Goethe's poetry and the sympathy drawn by Prometheus's self-spoken defense in Aeschylus's play overshadow here other elements of the Promethean mythos in this segment. Prometheus the savior is a flawed figure capable of mistakes, but a vehicle for either the salvation or destruction of humanity. Successful or not, we are asked to offer an amount of pity first and foremost. Romantic authors and the early modernists often equated Prometheus and the gift of fire with technological and scientific progress. This is most immediately evident in the full title of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, a title that is very difficult to actually find printed on the cover of a book, by the way, uh, which interrogates the consequences for Victor Frankenstein when he usurps the natural progress of life by imparting its spark while neither God nor mother. This question of the boundary of science has given Prometheus great appeal in works of science fiction in particular, especially those that edge on horror. H.R. Geiger's visual effects in the Alien franchise of films, including its 2012 prequel film Prometheus, the Protheans of the Mass Effect series, Stargate SG-1's vessel named Prometheus, linked as it is to a parasitic alien race, all highlight the interplay of technological overreach and scientific achievement with a tinge of Lovecraftian horror. Beyond science, this science fiction vein of Prometheus's place in the imagination finds interplay with ancient astronaut theory. This pseudoscientific hypothesis proposed outside of fiction in the 1960s and popularized by books such as Denikin's Chariots of the Gods argues for the intervention of extraterrestrial visitors pivotal in the uplift of humanity and construction of ancient monuments. Speculative inclusion of aliens within hard rock and metal is nothing new. 1983 saw the release of Blue Oyster Cult's Take Me Away, appealing to extraterrestrial visitors after all. Metal's intersection of Prometheus as a vehicle for inspiration, scientific advancement, and perhaps even extraterrestrial influence finds its most direct example in my research in Luca Turilli's Rhapsody's 2015 album Prometheus, Symphonia Ignis Divinus. The link between Prometheus and speculative science fiction is plain to hear if we read a few verses. 
quantum nexus, nuclear fire, human cyborgs, gods and titans, neogenetic modus, karma, alien fetus, matrix corpus, and then shifting into Latin with translation on the right here for you. Alpha ignis signum astralis, flamma omega multiversalis, alpha ignis signum astralis, donum eus prometheus. Uh, translation my own, not provided by Luca Turilli for me here, sorry. Similar echoes of Prometheus as inspiration of humanity, albeit with a darker tone, is found in Septic Flesh's 2014 Prometheus from the album Titan. Uh, repeated invocations to guide us, Deus, your fire in our hearts, Deus ex machina. The children of Prometheus, as a giant standing tall in a shadow, close the blackness. Prometheus, as your breed, we are bound to fall, but our light will scare the darkness. Repeated echoes and appeals to Prometheus as the Deus ex machina, a god from the machine, highlight the lineage of humanity through the Titan who stands against the gods that may draw upon the Aesopic notions of Prometheus as sculptor, we heard in Xenobiotic's description of Prometheus as maker of humanity from clay, or may highlight the uh, influence of the recent release of Ridley Scott's Prometheus in 2012, just two years before, fronting the godlike aliens described using the name of the Thief of Fire. Uh, while the last category, Prometheus as Messiah, is the least common in metal music, its presence is still worth noting and considering. Whereas the Satan category I outlined above may interact with the theme of punishment, the punishment is highlighted largely for its injustice. Here, links to the redemptive power of Prometheus's punishment, usually through direct comparison to the crucifixion of Jesus or to an angelic struggle, serves as the point of intersection. The earliest instance of this overlap I've found comes from the song Prometheus, a 1998 track from Telemetry of a Fallen Angel by dark wave band The Crook's Shadows. The lyrics paint a clear line between Prometheus and the nails of Jesus' cross. Again, a few selections. I am crucified, there shall be no more mockery of the gifts of the gods, no more comparisons, no more distortions. My heart is heavy as stone. I am Prometheus, all courses I am aware of from here. One final nail, unnamed, undriven, this nail shall represent hope. Uh, these are the full lyrics of the song, by the by. This link is noteworthy, but outside the name drop of Prometheus, there is little engagement with the larger mythos in question. By contrast, Triviums of Prometheus and the Crucifix is much more direct in its comparison. I am the Promethean, tragic figure in this dream, dream known as life, known as life, I bring spark into the lives, take the molded, show them fire, fires spark in their eyes. My flesh is ripped daily, it's the cross I bear. Later, I am made exemplary, lashed up by the public scene for bearing my heart, my soul's on fire. I pull my ribs open now, bleed my heart upon the grounds, drink of the blood, take me in. I believe this is a reference to Eucharistic blood from uh, ritual service in Christianity. Finally, chain me down, nail me up. It feels so cold on my skin. Flesh cut deep from their claws, chew my organs out, salivating with hate. Crown of thorns, deadly boards won't make me cease to be. You've turned this scapegoat into the lion that will devour you whole. This image of Prometheus as Christ analog draws striking connections between the suffering of the two figures, but shifts the target of the rebellious act in a fascinating way. The you addressed in the final quoted lines likely is a reference uh, to the Roman government embodied in Pontius Pilate in the gospel narratives who sees to the execution of Jesus. This rebellion is not against God, but an unjust society. Prometheus's divine punishment by Zeus is not made a direct parallel to the crucifixion by attributing the source of Jesus's death to the God of Abraham. The shift in lens toward unjust systems of society focusing on Zeus as king rather than deity, permits a Christianized expression of rebellion that still draws on the misotheistic Titan. So in this brief survey, I aimed to highlight four common ways that lyricists in metal music deploy Prometheus. Most commonly, he is a figure analogous to Milton's Lucifer, a glorified rebel against a divine authority condemned as unjust. Prometheus may also appear as a savior and benefactor of humankind, focusing on the good intention of the gift of fire and civilization, whether or not we mortals use it well. 
As Muse, Prometheus is synonymous with scientific progress, though often tinged with the darker questions of overreach and horrors beyond our understanding. Finally, we've seen that Prometheus can be equated to Christ's crucifixion in those instances where the source of angst and rebellion comes from societal structures outside religious institutions. The categories proposed here are not meant to be exclusive or even fully separate. Through many of these examples, the line between Satan, Savior, Muse, and Messiah is blurry, more like a series of overlapping Venn diagrams than neat little boxes. The interplay between these categories and the complicated mythic history of the Titan who stole fire from Olympus provides a rich tapestry of metaphor and influence to study. Uh, I'd like to conclude by noting two elements of the ancient stories of Prometheus that I've been unable to locate in metal music, knowing we have uh, artists here, maybe these can serve as some fun options in the future. Within the Aesopica, Prometheus is a craftsman, a trope we have seen, but I've never found an account of his drinking party with Bacchus, which sounds like it would be a great song. Finally, in The Birds by Aristophanes, a comedy satirizing many aspects of Athenian civil life, Prometheus appears in line 1494 and following, hiding among mortals by means of a parasol, shielding himself from the view of the gods above. Prometheus was by mythic account unbound by Heracles, so where might his tricks and cunning take him next? Uh, thank you, uh, that's my paper and obligatory cat photo of my cat Minerva. Excellent. Thank you so much for this uh, excellent, well, paper and uh, really thorough overview of Prometheus uh, tradition in heavy metal. Um, now let's open it up for, for questions from, from the audience. Give people either a few minutes to, uh, a few seconds to write or um, I'll raise their hand. Uh, I'll just briefly address the question, Mom. My cat's name is Minerva. Uh, she goes by <laughs> Minnie. Excellent. Couldn't be better. Um, all right. Well, we have a question here from uh, Amanda. Uh, she would like to know if uh, you, Peter, could expand upon the metal connections to Prometheus 2017 film. It seemed to be mentioned in passing, and she's interested in it. Yeah. Um, so I don't no in particular any immediately direct connections but i do think that the uptick in these kinds of technology dubious science fictions questions of science fiction dystopias um have been uh important in kind of bringing prometheus back to the front i tried to highlight some examples from contemporary sci-fi mm -hmm. um and uh I think that the link there is a kind of indirect one. Um, and so it's not directly Prometheus himself, but the Prometheus of the early modernists um, that we see constantly bringing up there. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to be able to point to a more direct line. Um, I haven't specifically found one other than sci-fi is popular and I've seen a lot of spaceships on metal albums recently. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, right, we have another question um, from uh, this time from Christopher Fletcher. Uh, he's asking about uh, sub genre, um, but he was wondering if you could say a bit more how you see these different aspects uh, appealing to different sub genres. Yeah, um, I would be more than happy to talk about that. I, in the interest of time, cut a small paragraph dealing with this from the paper before I uploaded it, but um, I am really interested in um, the interaction between lyrical accessibility in different subgenres and the um, deployment of some of these themes. So for example, um, some of the more prog influenced um, genres, uh, Luca Turilli, who's one of my favorite artists, so I had to dedicate a section to him, um, has a very clean vocal style in his presentation. Um, Whereas if you listen to Xenobiotic's album, uh, it's very hard, at least for me, to understand the words in particular, given the vocal style, um, without the kind of album supplement or access online. 
uh, I would really want to be digging into uh, that. I wouldn't know that the songs are specifically about Prometheus, except for maybe catching a piece here and there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there is a really fascinating kind of um, more, more musically literate study than I am capable of doing <laughs> uh, that investigates some of that point of lyrical access um, and the way that subgenres do things. Um, but broadly, what I've found is um, the heavier and darker pieces of metal um, are more likely to draw on the satanic elements, the overlaps with Lucifer, um, right. and the more kind of technical edging kind of symphonic sections um, are maybe more interested in exploring some of those science fiction connection themes. Uh, but again, I don't want to indicate that these are heavy boxes. These are tendencies. Um, mm -hmm. And boy, yep. it's all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can imagine. Um, thank you. Uh, yep. Another question uh, here, this time from Marius, another one of our <laughs> panelists here. Um, I, I think he wrote this in the general chat uh, for everybody. Um, can we consider Prometheus more like the poster boy for Luciferianism in metal rather than the traditional Satanism? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Prometheus is just such a ready application of that. Um, he's, he is in many ways uh, an easier Lucifer to like, at, at least for me, because uh, the Greek gods are themselves so deeply flawed. Uh, Zeus is a very easy god to dislike. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, he is not only a rebel, but he's a rebel where even if you take all the um, like back baggage of Greek religion, like the, the ancient Greeks were able to still por portray him as pitiable, as treated wrongly by mm -hmm. the king of the gods they were still raising temples to. Like yeah. it is fascinating to see that that is the case. And while certainly metal is going to work to transgress the societies that it is in now, um, you know, f finding those overlaps where it is like Milton's Lucifer is uh, really fun for me. Um, it, you can definitely put him up as that kind of like OG poster boy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, we have a few more minutes and we have a few more questions. Um, there's a question here. Uh, I've never seen a chat, a Zoom chat this active, so that's really great going, everybody. Um, Prometheus, as well as Satan, is related to absolute freedom. Absolute freedom has an understanding of chaos, of an overflow and disorder, and this confronts us with our limitations as sentient and finite beings. This, make us for, uh, this makes us face a question we can't avoid. Do you think that, we, that when we acknowledge the connotation of absolute freedom, we are put face to face with our limitations? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that kind of tension between freedom and fitting within a system um, is kind of at the heart of a lot of these Promethean myths and that kind of struggle that uh, Wroblowski was pointing to where we're dealing with some of these questions of technology and society where being an individual becomes harder and harder in a world that feels increasingly global and finding that um, point where you can be free. Um, you know, I go back to that lyric about how Prometheus is free despite chained, um, kind of like the uh, thought that we must imagine Sisyphus happy, like where in the toil and in the pain do you find that joy and freedom expressed? Um, that's in my, in my mind, many of the kind of common challenges of what these myths um, are presenting. Um, and also I think part of why they're still appealing. Um, I, I have a side thought on some of the common ideas that Prometheus providing civilization and then being punished for it looks a lot like the Enochian watchers and the kind of fallen angels of that tradition. And I think that's easy to see why it's become so kind of universal and syncretized through a variety of modern reads of uh, the Promethean myth, um, an attempt to make it standard and why it appeals to things like ancient astronaut theory that wants to take a little bit from everywhere to build a case for a global origin of humanity, you know, flawed as the approach may be. Okay, thank you for that yeah. response. Um, a 
couple more questions before I think we, we have to move, move mm -hmm. on. Um, the relationship between Prometheus and technology is a big thing in Heidegger and philosophy and the philosophy of a lot of other philosophers influ influenced by Heidegger. Heidegger himself, however, we could say was influenced by Spengler and the whole concept of Faustian cultures. Do you think that this interplay between Faust and Prometheus, uh, sorry, do you think that this interplay between uh, Faust and Prometheus that we can perceive in metal was influenced by this connection developed first of all in philosophical texts? I mean, I think that the, in many ways, those philosophical texts that are being pointed to are kind of the underpinning for a lot of the uh, contemporary reception of Prometheus um, as they get disseminated and discussed. Um, and so I, I do think that they play a really important role um, but I also think equally important here is the um, internet accessibility of um, potentially out, you know, outdated, outmoded translations. Um, I was I was really struck in um, on this presentation yesterday um, on um, kind of ancient Mesopotamian myths. Um, I was finding the same kinds of points where the sections being quoted are open access translations and sources um, and usually the ones that are at the bottom of the Wikipedia pages in question. And I think that there's just um, a major piece of what those points of connection and access are influencing those pieces. Um, and so the fact that you can find those archive.org links ready mm -hmm. um, plays, I think, just as much a role, um, maybe in the direct citation of where words are coming from, but also um, that broader philosophical scheme that's influenced some of how the um, you know, North American and European university models are disseminating some of these ideas through philosoph philosophy classrooms. Okay, great response. Um, finally, and then we must move on. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just a, a general question about method, for how we talk about layers of reception of a character or theme from antiquity through medieval and early modern times. Can we? Is, is there some, uh, we've talked about themes here today, but uh, could, we, could, we use, could, we, could we use or develop another kind of methodology as well? Yeah. I'm um, in, sorry, I'm interested in this also because I've done some work on Alexander. Yes. Um, uh, no, I, so I tried to focus on um, what themes were being brought out and if they mm -hmm. sounded like things that were presented in, the er in earlier sources, mm -hmm. could I find um, points of connection that are too similar to be um, mm -hmm. pointed to there otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a really interesting kind of musical logical in with a study of the you know, particular riffs and approaches to try to find mm -hmm. is there within these subgenres lineages of these kinds of common mythologies um, cross pollinating. I can't do that. I barely passed music theory. Uh, don't <laughs> ask me to do that. Um, but uh, I think that beyond my like kind of pretty strictly um, mm -hmm. uh, literary work here, um, Jeremy did a series of posts on his blog about kind of the reception of um, mm -hmm. some of the major tragedians of Athens. Um, and part of what he brought in there was an art historical analysis, looking at the album artwork um, where it pointed to lines of reception and maybe made some missteps or some interesting pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's definitely an art historical element here. Um, I mean, I, this is part of what I've found very fun about this is it can be and really must be so inter, interdisciplinary definitely. that um, that approach is going to, all of that together will actually get, build us a real picture uh, beyond this like initial sketch. Great. I hope that answered the question. That, I think so, I think so. Um, yeah, but thank you, thank you again for extremely thought-provoking paper, and thank you to all for these uh, wonderful questions. I'm sure there will be time in the social hour afterwards to talk more about uh, about all these things.